I'm going to give you the, the hardest, greatest problem in all of Scripture. Th this is it. If you've been here in this church, you've heard it a million times, but some of you haven't, so the people in this church are going to hear, hear it a million and one now. This is the greatest problem in the Bible. If God is good, He can't forgive you. If God is righteous and holy, He cannot forgive you. And you say, what? That's it, really. The greatest problem in all the Scripture, we see it in Exodus, we see it in Psalms, we even see it in the book of Proverbs. We see Paul dealing with it in Romans chapter 3. And it's this problem. If God is just, how can He just simply, as He says, turn His back to your sin? How can He cover your sin? How can He cast your sin away from you as far as the east is from the west? Literally, in the book of Psalms, and again... In Romans 4, it's He covers it. What do we think about a judge who, t who sweeps crimes under the rug? Do we call Him righteous? No, we don't, do we? We call Him corrupt. Is He maintaining righteousness? Absolutely not. He's defaming righteousness. You see, therein lies the great problem in the Bible. God is righteous. And because He is righteous, and because He is holy, and guess what? Because He is love, He hates hates evil. Some people say, well, God is love and therefore He doesn't hate. No, God is love and therefore He must hate. He hates evil. He can't just turn His back on evil and He can't just turn His back on your evil or my evil or anyone else's evil. God is a righteous judge. And shall not the God of all the earth do right? So the great question in the Bible is how can God be just and yet simply forgive wicked men? How can He do it? The answer is in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is what so many people do not understand about the cross. God in His righteousness condemns man. Every man, everyone here, everyone who's ever walked the planet since Adam condemned in our sin. And all the religion, all the church going, everything else you might want to add to it, it's not going to help you one bit. You're condemned. To be in heaven, you must be perfect. Have perfect righteousness. And none of us have that. And God cannot do it any other way because He is righteous. He cannot sweep your sin in a basket or under a rug. So God in His righteousness condemns you, and me, and all of humanity. And then God in His love becomes a man and He lives the life you could not live, that I could not live. Not only is He avoiding sin, but at the same time He is living a life of perfect Righteousness, not only avoiding the negative, but always doing the positive. A perfect, righteous life. And then that Son of God, He goes to Calvary. And on Calvary, He dies. But now here's the problem. When you hear all those Easter sermons and everything else, mainly what do you hear? You hear about the Romans you know, nailing him to a tree and beating him and stabbing him with a lance. And you hear about all the things the Romans did to Jesus and it killed him. And when you hear that kind of preaching, that kind of preaching is totally missing the point. We are not saved from our sins because the Romans beat up Jesus and killed Him. We are saved from our sins because when He was on the tree, all of your sin was imputed to Him. And then God in heaven turned away from His only Son, not because He lacked the moral fortitude to see Him suffer. No, He turned away from His only Son because His only Son became sin. And the separation from God that you should experience and I should experience throughout all of eternity, the Son of God experienced on that tree. And then there was not just the negative withdrawal of God's presence from Christ so that He cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then all the full force of God's wrath, of His holy hatred against you and your crimes and me and my crimes that as a holy God, He must 
pour out, He poured out on His own Son. As the prophet in Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, And it pleased the Lord, the four consonant Yahweh, it pleased Yahweh to crush the Messiah, to crush Him under the full force of His wrath. You know, many of you have read the Bible. He's in the garden and He cries out, Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Three times. Do you honestly think that our Savior was afraid of a Roman lance? How is it that Je so many people think that when Jesus is looking at this cup, He is thinking, you know, about the cross and the beatings and everything else, and it causes Him to sweat drops of blood. Really? How is it then, and then count the apostles, all but John, and countless martyrs went to the cross, and church history tells us they were singing hymns. They were full of joy at being crucified like their Lord. So how is it that they had more boldness than their Savior. Jesus was not sweating drops of blood in the garden because, simply because of a Roman cross. It was because He had always dwelt in the bosom of the Father. Perfect delight between one another. He had always been the beloved Son in whom the Father was well pleased. And on that tree, the Father withdrew His presence from His Son as He should from us. And then His Father crushed His Son. That's what was in the cup. The wrath of Almighty God against every sin we've committed. And He drank it down. And when He cried out, It is finished! He turned the cup over and not one drop came out. He drank it all. Paid in full. And He died. And on the third day, He was raised. By His own power, by the Spirit's power, and by the power of the Father, He was raised. And Romans tells us that that is God's sign. That is God's vindication of His Son and proof that that death He died on Calvary was sufficient to pay for all your sins. So what does it mean to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God? It's not just, I love His teachings and I follow Him. It is this. I have nothing. I have no righteousness. I have no hope except what God did for me on Calvary and in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That is my hope. If I stood in the midst of the most horribly wicked people in a massive den of iniquity and I stood there, I was transposed there right now, translated to that place, the only thing that separates me in the eyes of God from them is the cross of Calvary where Jesus Christ died for my sins. That's it. And I want to tell you something. If you add any of your supposed virtue to that, you do not believe in the Son of God. I hear so many people tell me, yeah, I'm a Christian. Are you believing in Jesus? Yes, I am. Well, if you died right now, where would you go? Well, uh, I think I'd, I'd go to heaven. Why? Well, I've been, I've been good. I've been a good person. Do you see the disconnect? <laughs> what? What? You've been a good person. <laughs> really? Really? Good enough to take any one of those thoughts and stand before God and risk all of eternity on it? Well, people, some people will say, and they said this in Romans 5 and Romans 6, that's what Paul was answering to. They said, well, if you're saying that, that it's just faith in Jesus and not our works, then, then people will just believe in Jesus and then live like the devil and they're going to heaven? Absolutely not. You see, there's two doctrines in the Bible you need to understand. The first one is justification. What is justification? It is a legal declaration. The person who believes in Jesus Christ is legally justified before God. God looks at that person as right with Him, not on the basis of their virtue, but on the basis of what Christ did for them. 
God declares them righteous. That's the believer's standing. But then there's another doctrine called the doctrine of regeneration. If you've read the Bible, you've heard it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are new. What does that mean? It means those who truly believe in Jesus Christ have also been born again or what we call regenerated by the Holy Spirit. They've been made alive. So that it's not them believing in Jesus and then doing a bunch of righteous things that they hate. But it's they're believing in Jesus and they're saved. And because of that salvation and because of the power of God to transform a life, they now begin to walk in newness of life. But never is their standing before God based upon what they do. It's based upon the cross of Calvary. Christ, Christ alone. Now I'm going to finish with an illustration. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't apply to you, but it may give you some insight into what I'm talking about. First heard this from a dear friend of mine, Charles Leiter, and it's a wonderful illustration. Let's say that we own a bunch of sheep, and we got a problem. There's a bunch of coyotes. Now how do we solve the problem? Well, there's a few ways we can solve the problem. One is we can get a gun and we can shoot the coyotes. Now that solves the sheep's problem, solves our problem, but it doesn't solve the coyotes' problem. What else can we do? Well, we could get a cage, and we could trap the coyote. We could trap him. So we've solved the sheep's problem, we've solved our problem, but we really haven't solved the coyote's problem. You say, well, he's reformed. No, he isn't. He's just caged. He's not reformed. He walks back and forth in that cage, back and forth like this, and just wanting to get out. You let that door open, he's coming out of there. So we haven't solved this problem. You know what I just described? Religion. And a lot of Christian religion. I go to church, I hate it, but I'm going because it's the right thing to do. Do this because it's the right thing to do, because i got to do it. There's really no love for God. There's no genuine desire to serve Him. Just got to do these things. That's legalism. That's religion. That's church. Why do we have to go? It's the same way as the coyote saying, why can't I just eat sheep? And every time someone's not looking and every time that door's open, you're going to eat sheep. You're going to sin because that's what you love. Now what is Christianity? God changes the coyote into a sheep. That's Christianity from the inside. He changes their heart. He takes out their heart of stone and He gives them a heart of flesh. And that's how you know you've become a Christian. Not just because you give some empty profession that, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, but because something, as it happened to Peter, something more than flesh and blood happened to you. God showed you this is His Son. And He put an overwhelming new desire in you to follow Him and to please Him. Do you see that? I'll give you a lecture right now in ontology. And it's this. I have a nature. I have a will. And I have activity. Things I do. If my heart loves evil, my desire is for evil. Things of this world, the immoralities, the sensualities, the money, the what, everything that's in this world. If that's what my heart loves, then those desires, they influence my will. And my will pushes my activities. I'm driven. I'm driven by my will that's driven by my evil desires, and I do evil. But if someone can change this heart of mine so that the things I once loved I now hate, and the things I once hated, like righteousness, I now love, then I don't have to, there's not much to worry about after that because my new desires push my life in a completely different direction. And when I do sin, it breaks my heart because my heart's been made new.